Well, you know, it's very tough and a very delicate thing. Um, quite literally, that the adults had more problems with it than the kids, both in the movie and, and in the theater audiences. First of all, theater audiences with parents were not prepared for that. And we got a lot of angry <laughs> letters from parents thinking they were going to see the next Harry Potter. And uh, it was not. Um, but, you know... It, it again, Josh Hutcherson was so brilliant um, that uh, his ability to literally do it on that first or second take was just unbelievable. And you know, there's a scene where after he hits Scott Hoger and they're out in the hallway, and the teacher is talking to him, mm. and she's crying. After the scene, there's just a long pause. And all of a sudden you hear all this crying and we turn around, all the crew is crying. And these are tough. These are some Maori, you know, guys with all the tattoos, these giant filmmaker crew guys, just sobbing. They're just sobbing. It's huge guys. And they're just crying. And like, they're like, the director's like, do it again. And when the cameraman, like, no, I, just, I, I need a minute. I need a minute. You just hang on. And these guys were just devastated by it. And uh, cause it's tough. Stuff. Again, trying not to ruin it for someone who's not read it, but this, you know, tr there are tragedies that stop you in your tracks in life. And, and you know, <laughs> it was, they were such wonderful scenes. And I will take certain credits as a writer, but I was really doing a very honest adaptation straight from the book. And I knew if I could capture what was in the book, uh, we would have very, wonderful very tough scenes and uh as i mentioned you know disney initially didn't want to do any of that they just wanted to change that whole element mm -hmm. and uh they're like basically we want to change the last 20 pages of the book and i'm like well that is what the book is british terabithia the last 20 pages of the book is what british terabithia is and if you change that then you no longer have the book and like no 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 we we could throw in some more monsters and some more imaginary stuff. And I'm just like, no, that's, that's, that's not it. It's uh, and again, that's why it took me so long to get the movie made. Cause I was going to protect those last 20 pages. You know, I was going to fight tooth and nail to keep it ending the way it ended. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So uh, fire away, Jack. Right. So um, what was, your favorite part of the movie between getting payback against Janice or the adventures in Terabithia? Favorite. You know, to be honest, um, my favorite moments were, um, I, I'll get in trouble this for, I think, but some of the special effects I thought were just quite nice. And mm -hmm. um, because I know the book so well, I know the book back and forth. So I know, I knew every scene that was coming. But I knew we didn't have a lot of money uh, on the budget. And when they first climb the tree and they see all of Terabithia, you know, when they're in the swing of pines, I was like, wow, that looks pretty cool. And even the very end of the movie, because such a tough thing has happened, really horrible thing has happened for Jess to take um, Maybelle across the bridge to see Terabithia. I mean, that was one of the biggest actually special effects moments in the entire movie was them seeing Terabithia. And uh, I was always very skeptical how we were going to do that. And um, I just really, really loved it because I had nothing to do with it. And I still liked it, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense. Because, again, yeah. I only knew I only had so much control. And so I would fought, I fought for what I could fight. But things that weren't in the book and I didn't write, I'm like, I don't know how this is going to go. And, uh, you know, and. I mean, if we had 12 hours, I could tell you everything that I didn't like in the movie, but I'm not going to do that because, uh, you know, we don't have that much time. You know, the fact is, uh, A, I'm Scottish and B, I'm the writer. So I have many, many ways to complain about things. So, you know, when people say, what do you like about the movie? I usually want to talk about what I didn't like because <laughs> then I would have liked the movie a lot more. But, you know, you're not supposed to do that. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what I tell people is when it comes to British Terabithia, I was about 68 percent happy with the final product. 
And for a writer who was not the director on it, that's an astronomical number because usually writers say for a movie that they had no control over, they were like 28% happy with it. I mean, some are just happy to get paid, but you know, again, when you're trying to protect basically a family legacy, uh, you're going to be fighting extra hard. And, you know, so again, I'm telling you some fun parts, but when people say, was it fun to make Bridge Terabithia? I'm like, no, it was a marathon. It was every day getting up, running really hard, really fast, trying to make sure you finish the race and you finish in, in a decent place, you mm -hmm. know, because, um, you know, you know, it can go off the rails, you know, you can fall, you know, can, someone can knock you out of the race. And so it, it, it making movies can be exhausting when you don't have full control of it. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, you're looking for problems, you're looking for trouble that you can try to head off and fix. So everything continues to move forward. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Just a question. Uh, what do you think was on the dad's mind in the movie when he gets closer to his son after the tragedy? Like what made him change his mind about it all of a sudden you think? I think the simple fact is no one expects a tragedy of that level. Again, I always got to be so careful about saying that. And, and he sees, he sees a wounded child who was also his son, you know, who for years, he just told him to buck up, you know, life is tough, you know, get over it. He witnesses something that even he had never witnessed. And he understands the wound that his son is struggling with. And he realized he has to be a dad. He has to be a father, as opposed to a bully in a lot of respects, you know, he really has to be Jesse's friend, which he always never wanted to be. He wanted to be the father and teach him how to be tough. And, and so he realized at that moment, he has to be Jesse's friend. He has to be his supporter. He has to be his guide. And I think as well that he probably realized with that tragedy that he had taken relationships for granted, especially with Jess, you know, what do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, I think even when he saw some of the artwork, he realized that his son is actually a pretty good artist, you know, as much as he, you know, knocks him for it. And I think he, he does learn that he has a gifted child um, with potential um and certainly by the end of the movie he knows he has a severely wounded child that at this point he needs to step up and make sure he can help take care of him that's really good what was it what was the point of the scene at the end of the, towards the end of the movie when the teacher calls jesse out for a talk and she happens to suddenly reveal herself as being compassionate and empathetic as opposed to just no nonsense well, I think it's, again, just to show, um, just like in my life experience, adults struggling to deal with a tragedy that no one ever should have to struggle with. And so she, her name was Monster Mouth Meyer. She was known as a very tough, mean teacher. Nothing, you know, cold as ice. Nothing would break her. And then you have this this wonderful scene, which, again, is in the book, so I won't take credit for it, where you see this woman, too, has a huge heart. And... She suffered a terrific wound that she's kept hidden for this long. So she understands what Jesse is going through because I think she actually says, I don't know, remember the, but the exact wording, but she has a wound that's never healed either. And so. Yeah. Fire away, Jack. Right. So what was um, working with Gabor Cusp like? Gabor Chupo? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, well, he was he was an interesting guy. Um, he had never done a live action film before. Um, he was known for the Rugrats and animated films and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. he had he had a learning curve as well um, th to learn about literally, you know, live action film. A great positive that he had was he knew kids, you know, creating the Rugrats and stuff like that. So he got along great with the kids and was able to really. Um, you know, get along with them, which is very important when you're a director and you're dealing with children, because it can be 
very uncomfortable kids taking i mean think about it you're showing up and meeting someone for the very first time and then you're going to be very uh basing under their thumb for the next you know 30 to 40 days you know with them telling you someone who's never talked to you before telling you what to do every day who's not your parent so i thought he did that uh i thought he did a great job with that right um great to hear and yeah, um, the next one is kind of um, already kind of half answered already, but uh, um, how did you get uh, so many children onto the production? I'm going to assume that you guys just shot at a real school for that? Yes, yeah, yeah. we shot at a yeah. real school. But again, it was New Zealand during their mm. their summer, so the school was empty. So it was very easy mm. to get an empty school because no one was there. And mm. uh, usually in the United States when you're shooting um, – Films that involve children, you can only shoot on the weekends at schools because the schools are closed. It's very difficult to find a empty school at any time, even even during the summer, because there's summer school and stuff like that. So, a lot of a lot of school scenes are shot on the weekends. Mm. Yeah, that's really mm. cool to hear. Uh, what was the nature scene filmed at in New Zealand? Was it near Auckland, or was it in that area, or was it below? Auckland? We were on the North Island where we shot um an interesting thing about that is i don't know if you recall specifically but they were having an animal in the greenhouse and uh you know and this is supposed to take place in the united states but when you saw that creature that he actually catches in in the in the movie uh, that ain't anything that you'd ever seen in the united states it was some type of raccoonish character animal but that lived in new zealand so i mean when I saw that, I'm like, okay, that's nothing that lives in the U.S. Um, hopefully no one really picks up on it or complains because anyone will go, okay, what the heck was that? Because <laughs> it's not a raccoon. It's, it's not a possum. It's not, it, and it was some weird like lemur, possum, whatever. But, you know, people bought it. You know, they, they were okay with it. So it, it was not a problem. But, you know, it's things like that when you're shooting in another country, getting an American animal may not be that easy in fact when i was writing uh bridge you know i was trying to figure out how to make it a simpler movie to make i took the cow out if anyone's read the book jesse his best friend is his cow that he milks every day and talks to it and i had already made some movies and like yeah the cow's out because cows can be very unpredictable even they sometimes don't want to act or just be a jerk but i said we're not going to have a, we're not going to have a cow and you know they always say in the movie business don't work don't work with children or animals and I've jumped in full foot with that all the time. So at least I was going to get rid of the cow. So we did have a dog, but it was a cute dog and wasn't in that many scenes. So we got through it. This